the first time a few weeks ago I stepped out in shorts, I, I just immediately like stopped and realized how strange I must look and that that could be quite unnerving for them. But that's not going to stop me from being myself. I think that's going to take a little bit of getting used to, but I can't let that bother me or change the way I live. But I'm sure that it's um, that they don't like it. Um, in fact, in my lease, it, it is in my lease that that you can't be in a state of undress, meaning bathing suit or something like that. Like we've been asked, we used to have a hammock and we've been asked to not um, to, to please not just and our landlord is very kind about it, but please don't lay out in your bathing suit and the hammock, things like that, just because of the, the young girls that live next door. The fear of any influence, the fear of, you know, I don't think they want their children to see that. There was a time when kids used to be able to go down to this community center uh, to uh, do some homework after hours. I took my kids up, I said, no more. And the reason is very simple. When my kid gets out of line or does something wrong, the m biggest outburst my kid will give will be, oh God. But the kid next to her, and I'll be blunt to your listeners, will go, oh shit. I don't want my kid there. And if the world thinks I'm kidding, come into an orthodox school, we have no metal detectors, no security guards. You go to public school, you have to go to a metal detector, you have school safety guards. What happened here? So obviously the problem is not the education, the problem starts at home. And when you have a kid throwing foul language to kids who never heard this, the next thing you know, they repeat that. And you kind of wonder, where did they pick this up? So never put your kid in a place where you jeopardize its future or you jeopardize its life. So it's a problem. There's a certain control or lack of critical thinking. Critical thinking is not something that is taught in the religious schools. You're taught that this is what you have to believe, this is why you have to believe it, and there is not any alternative, and there's no other way to be happy, and there's no other way to be fulfilled. When they see people that appear to be happy and fulfilled, it's a contradiction to what they're being taught, because it's obvious that, that there are other ways to find happiness and fulfillment in life. And when they're forced to confront that, it is a threat to that idea that our way is the only way. In life, in every religion, you have to stand for something. If you're not, you fall for everything. Ju Judaism, if you're born and raised as an Orthodox Jew, it's full of life. It's full of responsibilities. It's full of commitments. You just don't walk away and say, there's a problem here. I can't handle it. There's a community the social services, we try to help you. We don't just walk away and try to solve our problems on a cold glass of beer. I think that there is a culture clash happening. I think that the Hasidic community, and I'm not speaking for everyone in the Hasidic community, um, for most the, the leaders who have stepped up and spoken in the media, that this is predominantly their neighborhood and so that they ha should have a voice and rights to having Bedford be a place where there's churches and schools and where they don't have to worry about a bike lane. But that's, that's beyond the issue because the cyclists are going to use that road and other people live here who need to use the road and need to have access to that road and be safe too. I want to say this very respectfully. I, don't, I, I always have a problem, so let me call them first, people. And then I'll, I'll uh, call them what Papers have called them, media people have called them, what TMZ has called them, and yuppies, hippies, hipsters, artists, uh, village people. 
to me, they don't make a difference. To me, they're people, hardworking people that are work. Somehow decided that there's a subway line between the village and Greenpoint or North 7, and for some reason, I don't know if it was one or 100, that decided that it's cheaper to live in Brooklyn and take the train into Manhattan than live in Manhattan there, or maybe that was overpopulated. And all of a sudden, within the span of two, three years, every commercial space was taken up. Some used as business and residential as a mixed use. And uh, this happened uh, beyond belief uh, within a span of five years, where so many people, and I would say 95% of them professionals, moved into the neighborhood. When I first heard about the idea for the action of repainting the bike lane, I thought, this is something that I need to document. This is something that needs to get out into the news. But I didn't think about the clash between hipsters and Hasidic Jews. I didn't think that that was really a central issue. I thought, it's you know, it's about bikes. It's about safety. Um, it's about, you know, New York City streets and laws and things like that. When I, when I saw the reaction that it was becoming a, a um, this confrontation between hipsters and Hasidic community... I thought, oh, you know, how unfortunate. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't want this to ever be the way it was perceived. Um, slowly, I've come to see the issue as actually really being something that there, there is, there is a, um, how do I say this? Okay. There, there is, intrinsically, there is kind of a, an opposition between, I think, the two communities. And this, this event has brought it out rather than being a misperception, it actually has brought to light like an actual conflict. Um, and I mean, I guess I just hope that it can be resolved in a, in a calm way. Mm -hmm.